that any of these are complete finished layouts. I think they show how we can change most anything about a page, including the layout, via CSS while keeping our HTML constant. Uh, I actually went back and revised one right before class because I had it as 80%. And at 80%, when it got too narrow, it dropped that link down there. And that's not good. All right. So what I did is I revised it to put it back to what it was originally, which is, I think, 600 pixels. So it won't go, but it, it won't cause the links to, to lose their position. But as you notice, these are two identical pages from the perspective of HTML, yet the CSS makes them look very different. And with a little more um, polish on these, we could get some decent looking layouts out of, out of either of these, um, either of these uh, techniques. So one of these was using absolute. So for example, in this case, the, the, the positions are, um, no, I'm sorry, this one was using absolute, where the positions were fixed. And this one was using a bit of relative uh, and a little bit of jello, because as you notice, the margins change a little bit. One thing we talked about last time towards the end of class is we talked about floating the stuff. And that's where we're going to pick up today. And we're going to make a version of this where we, uh, where we float all the different uh, properties of it. And we'll see how that works. Remember, the fixed design has its place. If you have a real intricate layout that you want to look pretty much exactly the same way um, then you can go with the fixed layout. Keep in mind that web development nowadays needs to take into account mobile to a large degree. Um, the amount of people that access websites uh, on mobile devices is, I don't have the, the current statistics on it, but if I remember correctly from a year or two back, it was approximately a third of all web traffic is mobile-based as opposed to desktop-based. So, and that's only going to go up. So more, pe more and more people are going to be using uh, mobile devices to access it. So these rigid layouts aren't good. You want to develop something that's flexible so that it can accommodate a wide screen and it can also accommodate a narrow screen. And floating is a big step in that direction. Now, there's a number of things that you can do to make your website work in both a mobile environment and a desktop environment. And we'll talk about some of those in an upcoming class. Um, but floating is a big step in that direction. So, let's go into here. Into this guy. And if you remember, we played with the floating just uh, a couple of paragraphs. I think. Ah, I'm opening this up in IE. I don't have the IE fix code in there. Let me open this up in Chrome to get what I really want. The idea of floating is that the browser looks at each thing and decides if it has enough space to put it in or not. In this case, I've made the width of these things 300 pixels and I floated them to the left. What that means is, depending on the width of the browser, it can either fit one, two, or three of them going across. All right? So, when the browser is, window is fully open and it's approximately 1,000 pixels going across, then it can fit 300 next to 300 next to 300. Now, a thing to consider is, if I go and add a margin here, I 
that margin gets added on to the 300. Additionally, in this case, the margin is going to get added on to the left and to the right. So each of these things are now going to be 320 pixels wide, right? 300 for the width, 10 for the right margin, 10 for the left margin. And notice they still fit. But as I narrow the window, first the one drops off, then the other one drops off. Now this is approximately what you would see in many mobile devices, something like this. And that's actually good, a single column. If you notice, many pages are optimized for mobile. Instead of having a multiple column, have a single column. On a desktop, it's good to have columns going across. Because your eye, if it was just one giant column, your eye has a hard time going up or down, and, and you, could, you could get confused reading. So that's why they separate a newspaper and web pages into columns. Um, so you have the space on a desktop browser to put three columns going across, but you don't on a mobile. So the floating layout sort of accommodates the best of both of those. Remember, the padding, the border, and the margin, they'll all add on to the width. So in other words, if I were to go and add a padding of, of 10, to each of these. And a border then we might not be able to get all three of them on the same line even when the browser is fully open. Because this is going to be 300 plus 10 on both sides, that would be 320, plus another 10 on both sides, that would be 340, plus another 5 on both sides, that would be 350. So each one of these, if I did my math right, and it's awful early in the morning to do that, but I think I did it at least close to right, uh, each one of these is going to be 350 pixels going across. So even if it's maximized, I still can't fit all three of them in. And that's one thing to remember when you're doing this. That's something that students often forget. It's like, well, 300, 300, 300, that's 900. Why isn't it fitting across my monitor, which is 1,000 pixels? Well, you've got to remember to add the padding and, and all that. Things get especially confusing when you start adding in percentages as well. Yes? What if the font was a lot smaller? What if the font was a lot smaller? Well... Well, keep in mind there's actually a couple of ways to zoom. And it depends on the specific way that you zoom. So like if you if zoom to 90% here is one way. Modern browser actually modern browsers actually handle the zooming a lot better than the older counterparts do. It actually zooms a page whereas older ones used to just increase or decrease the font size. So it would keep the same width, I believe, but it would, it would just change the font size, where this actually zooms stuff in. All right. Um, so let's go and let's make a version of this that floats. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to go into my CSS. And just for variety's sake, I'm going, to, I'm going to grab a background pattern instead of uh, the background image. I had that trail image, um, which, which was one giant image. What often is done is like you do with like 
tiles in a, in a, in a bathroom or in a, a room where you can tile together a small image multiple times and the tiles sort of interlock to form a pattern. So let me go out there and do a quick Google for background tile generator. And we can go, we can make our own little pattern. Maybe. I don't know what would be appropriate for skiing. Yeah. Let's do. Oh. Yes, there is. I don't know why I'm agonizing over this. It's not like, uh, you know, it has to be perfect. And we have our canvas choice to give a little texture. And then not really sure why the previews aren't showing correctly. Let's go with the stars. We can rotate them. All right, now I can download this. And it's downloading it as a file, pattern.png. So I'm going to bring that in here. And I'm going to set the background to pattern PNG. Now, I'm going to go in and the header, I'm going to want the header to go all the way across the screen. All right? So I'm going to say a width of 100%. I'm not going to specify a top and left position. Remember, with the floating, the idea is that the browser sort of figures out where to put these things based on what we have stated. So I'm going to float this guy to the left. And it's a hundred percent. So that's going to go all the way across the screen. All right. The navigation. I'm going to say I want a width of 300 pixels. But I'm going to specify, or I'm sorry, I'm going to say a width of 30 percent but I'm going to specify a minimum width of maybe 150 pixels. A minimum width says, hey, you can position this however that you want, but you can, you can size it based on a percentage, but don't get any smaller than 150 pixels. That way you won't get it on a tiny screen where it's just a couple of pixels wide. All right. So we can specify a minimum width. We can also do the same thing with a maximum width if we want. But I'm going to float that to the left. The article, I am going to make a width of 50%. And I am going to float it to the left. Finally, the footer, I'm going to make a width of 100%. And I'm going to put clear both. What does clear both do? That sort of resets the floating. In a nutshell, what that will do is this will cause the footer to not even try to fit alongside 
the uh, content area. It'll drop the footer down below the last thing on the page. So that's, that's something that you often do with a footer because you don't want the footer to maybe be to the side of the content. You want the footer always to be below that. So let's see how this works. And notice what happens at a certain point that does no longer fits, so it drops it below. Now I would say a couple of things for this. We can, we can make it maybe go a little better. Um, let's not make the header and footer be 100%. Let's maybe make those 80%. So there's a little bit of a, a gap around it, and we can see the background pattern peeking uh, along, uh, uh, you know, from, from behind it. So I'll go here and I'll make the width of 80%. And there we go. Does anyone remember how I can center that? I can center that by specifying a margin. Margin 10px auto. So that will do a margin of 10px on the top and bottom and it'll automatically set the left and right margin, which effectively will center it. Oh, absolutely. Difference between percent and pixels. Well, keep, well it's, it's half of it if it's full screen. But keep in mind that the percentage adjusts as the window size gets smaller. Window size gets smaller. So if I say 500 pixels, it'll be 500 pixels. And it doesn't matter if I'm displaying it on a big screen like this that's 3,000 pixels wide or if I'm displaying it on a little tiny phone that's 400 pixels wide. It's going to be 500 pixels. Whereas if I specify a percent, it, it depends on the screen. And also notice that I changed that from, I changed that to 80%. So as I resize the window, it gets smaller. If I made it 800 pixels, it would be stuck at 800. All right, so if I want to center it though, I go in and say margin 10 pixels. No, not necessarily. They often go together because the whole idea of this is to uh, the whole idea of this is to um, make it more flexible, make the layout flexible, and make it so that it, it moves to one side or the other. So let's try this, see what we get. Let's get rid of the margin. Let's put let's put a top margin or a bottom margin. Margin Bottom, ten px. 
So that puts a little gap between there. All right. I can go here for the navigation, and I can maybe make the width 20% with a minimum width of that. And I can specify maybe a margin of margin right of 10 pixels. And we'll leave the rest as it is. And notice how at that size, uh, we have a little bit of problem with that. We need to put a mar bottom margin of 10 pixels. And that puts a gap back between it. And let's make the footer 80 pixels to match the header. And we have that. All right. Questions on any of this? Yes. Uh-huh. That is a good question. If I just do margin auto. Um, let me go let me go back to one of the earlier examples we had and look at that. If I did, let's just have one article on the page and do margin auto and let's give it a width and a height. does not look like it does it vertically, just horizontally. One thing I do encourage you is, is that this is one of the, in my mind, most confusing aspects of CSS is the positioning. It, it, because it, it's one of those things that to do some very basic things are simple, but once you get into it and start doing and mixing and matching stuff, you run into difficulties. All right? So that's one of the most difficult things to do. So in my mind, experiment. All right? The other thing to do is if you're running, is, is to do the approach that I've, I've talked about, I think, in, in a lot of cases, is to not try to do everything all at once. Do a bit at a time. Because then if you do a bit and that part works, if you add on a bit and something breaks, well, chances are it's that thing that you added on. All right? Not always. Sometimes there's something that you didn't realize that happened before, but most of the time it's going to be the, the code that you just added. 
And it's easier to find a problem in five lines of code than in 500 lines of code. So therefore, do a piece at a time. And if you're ever having trouble with CSS, sometimes it's good to just temporarily get rid of the CSS and then slowly back it in, uh, add it back in until you find where it breaks. All right. The other thing that's effective to do with CSS, if things don't line up exactly the way that you want them to, is to give things like really outrageous colors. All right. That way you can see things and they visually stand out or put a border around things or something like that so you can actually see where things are appearing and, and where, where there's a, a potential for difficulty. All right. So, for example, Let's say I messed something up. I'm just going to put a bogus number in there of 300, which clearly isn't right. But if I go and save that, if I view my page now, oh, where did my links go? Oh, some of them are over there. What you could do is you could do stuff like, Hmm, where, why, where is that, where does all that extra space come from? Is it the nav area? Well, let's make the nav area pink. And let's make the nav UL have a background color of green. And then let's make the nav LI have a background color of red. And then finally let's make a let's make the link have a background color of orange. So I'm obviously not going to keep the page like that, but it's it's helpful in troubleshooting to go and you look at this and say, oh okay. My UL is only that wide. That's about as wide as it's supposed to be. My nav area is that wide. That's, that's as wide as it should be. The problem is, is that blue area starts all the way over there. All right? And therefore, uh, I could look at it and maybe determine the margin was set wrong for that. As opposed to if the margin was set maybe on the UL incorrectly, we get a different symptom, which isn't really obvious from what we have here, what's going on here. My guess is those links are behind this guy. If you run into trouble, what you can do, again, is get rid of all your CSS, all right, there's my links, they're still there, and then slowly add stuff back in. All right, still looking okay. You know, not exactly right, but. Okay. Ah, now I see what's going on. Those links are getting pushed way over there, and that green area is over here. So that's what's wrong with that. Now let me go and get rid of this so we don't save a horrible looking example.
All right, and then we're back to it like that. Um, Put a little space between them. Right. Well, that's a good question. The question was, is if, given the fact that since many people use um, uh, surf the web using a mobile device, why would anyone use pixels anymore? First of all, maybe they're not using it anymore. Maybe these are legacy things. Maybe these are things that were developed years ago when mobile wasn't particularly popular. All right? Maybe they're not a very savvy web developer. Um, you know, in every profession, whether you're talking about mechanics or chefs or, or hairstylists, yeah. Uh, there's people that do a good job at it and people that don't do a good job at it. So that's a possibility. A third possibility is that there are a number of techniques that you can use to style a page differently on a mobile device versus a desktop computer. All right. And again, not to, to steal my thunder of what we're going to talk about later on in the class, but one thing you can do is you can actually have separate pages. You can have a mobile version of the page and you can have a desktop version. So it's not the same HTML there, but you have two versions of the same page. If you do that, then it might be reasonable to style the desktop version using pixels and doing fixed things and then doing a different style for the mobile. There's also a way that you can apply multiple style sheets to the same page. And the style sheets are smart enough to where you can set conditions that say, if the screen size is such and such, apply this style sheet. If the screen size is something else, apply this style sheet. So you could write rules in there so the pixels only applied in the case of a bigger monitor or whatever. So there's a few reasons why, why you might want to do that. Um, again, ranging from the fact of, gee, we didn't think about that in 2006 when we, when we made this web page, to, gee, I missed class today that we talked about percentages, to, um, yeah, I'm handling, that, so I'm handling that issue in a different way. I'm handling that issue by, um, by using multiple style sheets or by um, using multiple web pages or, or whatever. All right? Questions at this point? Um, for, to a large degree, I could talk about this topic like forever. <laughs> All right? I probably, you know, some of you might be thinking I already have done that, but I could talk about this forever. All right? But really, once you have the basic idea of fixed positioning, floating positioning, and so on, What's really going to get you to the next level for that is just practice and just trying things. So that's why I encourage you in the labs to experiment and to, you know, to just try a bunch of different things. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention is what? I totally went blank on this. Oh, on some of the lab assignments, I've asked you to create two versions of the same page, like I've done here, where you create, uh, you create a page, then clone it, and just change the CSS file. Try to make as big a difference as possible. You know, I've had students turn in page one that was blue and page two that was slightly lighter blue, you know, and try to say, well, look, I used two different style sheets. Yeah, you did. So, strictly speaking, I guess you sort of did what the assignment asked for. But really, you know, it'll be in your benefit to really use that as an opportunity to experiment of how different you can make the pages. Uh, remember, we've only touched on some of the things that you can do via CSS. If you go and look on any site, 
any resource site, like for example, w3schools.com, you can see a whole slew of things that you can do with CSS. Stuff that you can do with the border property. So far we've only used the border property of solid. All right, maybe one time I used dotted. But you can use an inset, an outset, a ridge border, a groove border, and so on. Sometimes that might be appropriate. Um, text. I didn't really cover in the textbook the one chapter about formatting text. But there's all sorts of things that you can do with text to make, uh, to, to, to format the text in a certain way. You know, you can emphasize things, you can make things bold, and, and so on. There's a whole list of text things that you can do uh, with that. You can put more spacing between the letters, letter spacing. So I could do something like this. header h1 letter spacing one point four m maybe not one point four m maybe three pixels Let's try that. And then what that will do is put more spaces between the letters in the H1. All right, so notice how there's more space in between. If I wanted it tighter space, I could say negative three pixels. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, my, in, you know, th there's no way I could cover all of the attributes. You know, part of the, part of the, you know, and again, that's why, you know, I've had some students say, you know, you don't really use a textbook in class. Well, yeah, I don't use a textbook in class because you have the textbook and you can read the textbook and you can bring questions that you have about the textbook to class. It's my job, I think, to emphasize the stuff that's most important to talk about some basic techniques and to give you an overview, you can get the details from reading in the text, all these text uh, formatting things, or you can get some of them online or whatever. So uh, I encourage you to read uh, in the book because they'll talk about a whole bunch of other things like putting captions on photos and all these different techniques that you can use um, in formatting uh, the text uh, on your page. And again, Something like letter spacing, you know, that's a nice one for banners going across it. I don't like the narrow. Let's make it wider. Actually, let's, let's try an M. Let's see if M works. I guess it does. 2M means twice as much space as normal. Let's try maybe 1.3M. Oh, I see what it's doing, but it's acting weird. It's giving that much extra. So if I want like 10% more, I think I do point M. I don't do 1.1. 1.1 would give me 110% extra, which is not what I want. So there is 10% extra. So that's more in line with what I want. Um, I will say that Grading. Yesterday I graded you guys' Lab 5. For the most part, I saw great work. I mean, I was really pleased going through that. Uh, through, going through that. Um, and it wasn't like anyone did anything earth-shattering. 
all right, they just paid attention to the details, all right? And I probably should have written great job on just about all the entries, but I instead sort of gave the, the class a, a, a congratulatory pat on the back, all right, because there was great work done. And what was the difference? People didn't use just the default font. They went and changed the font to make it look nice, or they had a different font for the header that they had for the body of it. They carefully chose the backgrounds of the page so that it looked good. Um, they, they added some padding so that, you know, so that um, the, uh, the text wasn't all the way to the edge. There's an old saying, uh, the devil is in the details. Another way I've heard it put is that the design is in the details. All right. For most of the class, we haven't really spent too much time obsessing about the look of the page. We've talked about the technical aspect, and we've talked a little bit about how it looks and what you can do to style it. But that is an important portion of the design as well. It's an important portion of the design because, number one, it creates a mood. Uh, a lot of people, for example, on the assignment that talked about well-designed web pages, cited the Apple web page. All right. We look at that. There's nothing earth shattering about this, you know. Especially when web design first happened, a lot of people thought web design, good web design equated to flashy, eye attracting, fascinating things. But that's not why people go to web pages to be impressed. It's not like a fireworks show. People go to websites to get the information. And an organization, one of the things they want to do is they want to present some sort of corporate image. Now, Apple always has, always wants to portray the image of being um, sleek, well designed, modern. You could pick out any words that you want. And if you notice, their design fits that. All right? Not a lot of stuff on it. All right? Very minimalistic. Steve Jobs reportedly absolutely refused to have a second button on the mouse. Right? That's why Apple mice only have one button on it, because he thought that a two-mouse button was too difficult, too confusing. All right? And you can argue whether that's correct or not, but there's a vision there with that company, a vision of simplicity. All right? And this website evokes that image. All right? Some of the bad websites, I, I don't even feel, I would feel bad for bringing them up on the screen because, I don't know, they might give you vertigo or an upset stomach or something. And most of them, there was so much going on. All right? So much going on on them, where it was sort of the everything but the kitchen sink. The one analogy that I've given uh, a lot of times in classes is I said that some people, uh, especially beginners, and especially in the past, people are a little more sophisticated now, but they sort of viewed web design as like an all-you-can-eat buffet, right? When you go to an all-you-can-eat buffet, your goal is to get as much, you know, put as much as you can on your plate. Well. A lot of web designers did the same thing, put as much as they can on their web page. So they would have, you know, flaming logos and, and, and play a little background MIDI sound or whatever. And that's just horrible design because it showed off what they thought was their skill as a designer, but it made the page load much slower, it distracted people from the real intent, and it did not really give a, did not evoke sort of the image I think that, that most organizations would want. So things are a lot simpler now. But that doesn't mean you don't do these things. They carefully chose the font for this. They carefully chose the colors. They just did it in a very subdued, subtle way. Yes? I noticed that during the presentation part, all the time Yes. Yeah, I, 
would say so. Uh, and that's a good point. I mean, I, I've heard this, whether you're talking about musicians or artists or web designers or what. The, the statement that, uh, that I've heard often is, know the rules so you know when to break them. All right? I would say a rule is that you should have a title on your website. It should be clear beyond a shadow of a doubt what your website is. All right? Here, Apple breaks that rule. All right? Does that mean that they don't know what they're doing? Probably not. You know, uh, I'm sure the executives for Apple drive much fancier cars than me. All right? So they're probably doing something right. All right? The reason is, is they are so identifiable as a brand that iPhone or whatever their product is, whatever their current product is, is so closely tied with them that that sort of serves the role of a banner. In other words, you look at that, immediately you know you're on the Apple site by doing that. Plus, they have their very recognizable logo up here, um, sort of as that. So, yeah, in this case, they don't have a banner, yet I don't think anyone, unless you came from Mars or something, if you landed on this page, you'd know it was Apple's website. Yeah, you wouldn't, you know, if you know, if you have ever heard of Apple computers, if you landed on that website, you would know about it. That being said, that doesn't mean, don't take that as a message to say, oh, you don't have to put a title on your web pages, all right? No, they knew what they were doing when they broke the rules, all right? So you know the rules, and then you know the situations in which you can, you can bend the rules or, or break the rules. For most cases, yeah, put a title on your page. Because chances are your organization is not Apple computers, and it's not going to have that immediately identifiable um, image. Uh, for it. Yes? Yeah, yeah, they probably actually have zero uh, margin and, and padding. Well, maybe not padding, but zero margin because if you notice that's flush up against there. That's, yeah, right. Right. So yeah, if, if they, they did that. And again, this is one of those things to experiment. You actually can, for any code, you can do a right mouse yeah, and say view page source. The problem with that is, is sometimes it's difficult to decipher. Like in this case, notice that they have a whole bunch of style sheets. But we can actually look at those style sheets by clicking on that, maybe. Interesting. Try this. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be allowing me to do that, but typically you can, you can view the CSS as well. I don't know if they have some special means of preventing that from happening. But, um, yeah, you can, you can, in some cases you can see the code and, and you can duplicate that. It's okay to look at other people's code for inspiration, all right, but you don't want to just, you know, wholesale rip off chunks of code and, and try to pass it off on, on your own. That's plagiarism as much as, like, on a term paper it would be uh, to do that. That being said, you certainly can go and look at code that people have done and use that as a learning experience to learn how to do something similar on your own pages. Other questions? All right, time for lamb. <laughs>